Um, how I'm a bit hard of hearing, so can you hear it? I can't say that I hear it coming over, but there's so much noise yeah. that's possible that it's. And it's literally just on off. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to go straight up here. Good evening. Um, welcome to the Concord Museum. Um, I'm Reid Gotchberg. I'm the Associate Curator and Manager of Exhibitions here. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, Lawrence Buell, Professor Emeritus at Harvard University, the author of the brand new book, Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently, published just last week from Oxford University Press. And he will be joined in conversation by Ryan Hanley, Professor of Political Science at Boston College and a member of the Board of Governors and Chair of the Trustees of the Concord Museum. Lawrence Buell is the Powell, Am Powell M. Cabot Research Professor of American Literature Emeritus at Harvard University. He is a distinguished scholar of American literature, particularly American transcendentalism. His books include Literary Transcendentalism, New England Literary Culture, Emerson and the Dream of the Great American Novel, as well as numerous journal articles and edited collections. He is widely considered to be one of the founders of the eco-criticism movement through pathbreaking works such as The Environmental Imagination and Writing for an Endangered World. His research has had a tremendous impact on numerous fields within American studies and the environmental humanities. So on a more personal note, I'm especially delighted to welcome him to here at the museum tonight, given the enormous impact that he's had on my own career. Um, I first met Larry Buell as a student in his American Transcendentalism seminar, um, and I can trace a pretty direct line uh, from my current work here at the museum um, back to working together and even a field trip that our class took to Concord on a fall day that was a little bit colder than the one today. Um, I count myself incredibly lucky to have benefited um, from his kind and gentle generous mentorship and support over the years, as do so many of his former students. Um, and I'm excited to continue to benefit from his insights in this wonderful new book, um, which we'll, we will be hearing more about this evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Without further ado, Lawrence Buell and Ryan Hanley. Good. Well, uh, Larry, let me start by simply uh, echoing Reed and saying how delighted we are to have you out here in Concord. Thanks very much for joining us, and thanks very much for this truly wonderful book. Um, 
one of the most welcome features of the book, one of the things it does so well, is its sensitivity to all the different sides of Thoreau uh, and the way in which they may cohere. One of the things I liked best early on is your quotation from um, his response to his Harvard class agent about what he's been up to uh, 10 years after graduation. Uh, here's what uh, Thoreau writes for his class notes. Quote, I am a schoolmaster, a private tutor, a surveyor, a gardener, a farmer, a painter, I mean a house painter, a carpenter, a mason, a day laborer, a pencil maker. That's quite a list. And in your book, you go on and show us all the other sides, that he's an essayist, a lecturer, a philosopher, a poet, a flautist, a dancer, an environmentalist, a natural scientist, an abolitionist, a conscientious objector. That's a lot of Thoreau's. Um, may I begin by asking, of all of these, is there one that particularly resonates with you personally? You may, yes. <laughs> Although the challenge of the book was to try to uh, uh, look at least fleetingly at them all and see how that could constitute a whole person. Hmm. What happened? Message from administrator, that is not good. Um, <laughs> I was going to flash on the table of contents, but um, I can improv. Uh, so, in my history, oh, that's nicer than anything. That in my history, um, what drew me first was uh, Thoreau, the, the, the writer uh, of a particular kind. Uh, always drawn to uh, intellectual prose that sits at the borderline of literature, philosophy, religion, social thought. Um, even if it winds up being kind of messy and told various ways. Uh, so that um, put transcendentalism on my radar screen and uh, uh, especially Thoreau. And in this book, um, I think that's reflected in my lingering over uh, Thoreau, the um, sometimes easy-seeming, but in fact challenging prose writer, the hmm. motions of his prose. Um, and in what I uh, say all the way down the line about the, now, the table of contents, yes. Um, the ways in which the different facets of his personality collided, but also resonated with each other over the contradictions into a kind of uh, uh, synergy mm -hmm. of, or symbiosis of uh, opposites and tension. Um, the uh, political thorough that um, is uh, the engaged uh, oppositional activist, the man of the woods, the green thorough that seems the opposite. How do you reconcile those? So I think they can be. You have to read my book to see how. <laughs> uh, I'll make some comments on that later on. Uh, and then the, the quantitative and the qualitative thorough. He was a right brain, left brain person, both. Uh, sometimes they clashed, and sometimes he complained about it. Uh, but uh, they reinforced each other, too, in important ways. Um, so I guess, uh, Thoreau, the, yeah. Am I muffling the sound? <laughs> so, Thoreau, the creative writer in all his complications, um, with a sort of visionary torque to his prose, always, and the green Thoreau, Thoreau, the uh, proto-environmentalist and um, man of science in his later years, those I think were um, 
especially what drew me to Thoreau. Uh, and then trying to reconcile the, uh, the political Thoreau with uh, uh, the Hermit of Walden. Great. Um, I'm really glad to have this uh, table of contents up here because it reminds us about the way in which the book treats all of these different Thoreaus, uh, especially starting with the first chapter. Um, one of the striking ways in which the book is set up is uh, a presentation of um, um, Thoreau, the man, the man that we know was born here in Concord in 1817, dies here in 1862, um, but not just the historical Thoreau, also the Thoreau that on the first page you called the quote-unquote international folk hero, the man who inspired Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the countless seekers that we see in Walden Woods still coming and making their pilgrimages today. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you see the relationship between these two Thoreaus, the historical Thoreau, the man, and um, I don't want to say necessarily the myth, but the larger-than-life image, the folk hero that you also point to. In what ways are there overlaps between these, and what ways might the reputation and the historical man have diverged in important ways? Right. Well, uh, here are just a couple more images to frame what I'm about to say what I think I'm about to say, how do I know what I mean until I see what I say, says so I'm about writing poetry. So that's something like the way Thoreau looked um, in the mid-1850s. Um, notice the tousled hair, a daguerreotype portrait in those days, um, usually yielded a more uh, carefully groomed subject. But, uh, do you really want your Henry Groom. No. Um, and there's uh, an example of Thoreau, mythically rendered, the statue that many of you have seen um, uh, in um, at Walden Pond itself in the cabin in the background, the uh, replica. So, the man and the myth. Um, and I'll go back to the table of contents. No, stick with the man. Um, <laughs> for the moment, or a, a decent image of the man, considered the best uh, in his lifetime. Uh, well, I say in the book that he's one of the very few uh, creative writers in American history who has achieved something like folk hero status. Um, I suppose the other two would be Twain and Hemingway. Um, one evidence being uh, the burgeoning of the Thoreau Society uh, since its inception in 1941. Uh, it dwarfs the Emerson Society. Um, nothing against <laughs> Emerson. But, uh, <laughs> Thoreau Society always has been uh, a charming medley of scholars and, and real people. Uh, and, <laughs> with, with the Emerson Society, perpetually malnourished by contrast <laughs> to the Thoreau Society now with a week-long annual gathering and um, all sorts of bells and whistles. Um, that just goes to show the uh, worldwide uh, percolation of Thoreau's prestige. Uh, again, name your Thoreau. There are different facets. Uh, some, uh, for some, it's Thoreau the proto-ecologist or environmentalist, for some it's Thor the writer, for some it's Thor the spiritual seeker, uh, the mystical Thor. Uh, the Thor who was one of the first who might be described as uh, spiritual but not religious. Uh, and the political Thor, Thor the activist um, who coined the term civil disobedience, we think, and uh, who inspired MLK and Gandhi. Um, Thoreau himself had a lot to do with the mythification of himself. Um, not that he was uh, puffed up and aggrandized, uh, on the contrary. Uh, he tended to present as a diplomat uh, in person, if not in, in um, his writing. Not diffident, no, reserved. Um, Emerson said he, uh, uh, he most characteristically showed himself in opposition. He wanted to blunder to pillory. Um, 
And uh, when you, his first instinct when hearing the statement was to controvert it, uh, which is a little chilling, says Emerson suavely, to the social affections. Indeed, um, even though Emerson himself, in his um, essay on friendship, says, "I look in friendship for a manly." Uh, resistance, or at least a manly furtherance, and not a mush of concession. Um, that, that's pretty good. Leave the gender thing aside, but um, mm. both Emerson and Thoreau went about friendship that way, which meant that there was a bit of tension in their friendship, but we could talk about that later. Uh, but legend building. Uh, Thoreau uh, tended to magnify uh, the minute uh, in ways that um, that passage, if he went on, would show. Uh, he compares um, his multitude of interests uh, to um, the Hydra problem. And Hercules. Uh, yeah. A hundred different heads. And uh, I would wish that you would play the part of Aeolus, he says. Uh, or, well, I wish you would be. Uh, a Hercules and amputate some of those heads for me so life would be simpler. Okay. But this sort of um, mythification percolates throughout Walden. Um, he thinks of uh, what he's doing in Homeric terms as a kind of epic experiment. He thinks of himself self-consciously in relation to um, an ancient sage, uh, all of the Confucian books. Uh, and that starts very early. Um, I'm uh, musing about uh, the Penobscots as my Britons come to Rome. Um, so there's a sort of luminous haze uh, built around, uh, or a luminous glow built around um, the uh, daily incidents oftentimes and Thoreau's journal rendition of them that shows this um, magnification of the minute um, or the mundane, you might say, uh, that you find it another way in walking uh, with such concentration on um, the little things, the little material things, their importance about um, cutting up wood, um, sitting and watching uh, the critters around you, uh, listening to the sounds. Um, things get um, amplified as if uh, Walden, the book, were a vast echo chamber uh, in which a relatively modest and fail safe uh, and uh, secure experiment becomes blown up into cosmic proportions. I love it. Um, <laughs> There you are. Um, Great. You. What, one of the things I like best about the answer you just gave is you remind us of the degree to which um, Thoreau is gen genuinely um, a worldwide phenomenon. His influences are worldwide, drawing from, as you mentioned, the Confucian classics, the ancient Greek epics, uh, the Vedas, uh, and his influence has been worldwide. Um, but at the same time, as you very nicely show in the book, and now I can say, since we're here in Concord, um, he's a man of place. You use the word lococentric several times. And so, um, since we're gathered here in Concord, I have to ask some Concord questions. And sure. one would be, um, how are we to understand his relationship specifically first with Concord's people? Because on the one hand, he seems to have had a great admiration for many different individual Concordians, but at the same time, he has a very complex relationship to Concord society or the image of American society that he experienced through Concord. So could you say a little bit about his, um, um, his uh, experience and the way living with Concordians might have shaped him? Excellent question. Um, and I don't uh, think I have sole ownership over the uh, ultimate answer here. Yeah. But for openers, uh, Thoreau uh, will speak, think, and interact uh, much more constructively with individuals than when he's thinking about people in the mass. Mm -hmm. If you think about people in the mass uh, or in groups, um, this almost always kicks in the reflex that uh, 
society, qua society, society uh, as a group means pressure to conform uh, and uh, whether intended uh, benignly or not uh, to, to uh, drive you into a kind of inauthenticity mm -hmm. that um, you need to resist uh, in order to maintain your integrity. So that's one answer. Another answer is that, that he was a shy guy. Mm -hmm. um, and he was more comfortable with people that he knew. Most people are, but considerably more comfortable with people that he knew um, than he was with people that he didn't. Uh, he was um, more comfortable with kids than with adults on the whole, I think. He loved to play with children. Uh, the Emerson children, for example, loved him. Um, Edward Emerson, uh, uh, the youngest of the four, uh, wrote a memoir in old age. Henry Thoreau is remembered by a young friend. It's a really uh, lovely book. Mm. Um, and brings out that uh, tender side of, of Henry. I uh, say at one point, uh, Emerson characterized uh, Thoreau as a Peter Pan. Um, not, I'm sorry, as a Pan a great god Pan who uh, lured people out into the woods, but he was also a Peter Pan, a kid in some ways who never grew up. Um, the uh, other thing I guess I'd say is that um, unlettered folk, um, farmers, rural types, um, who didn't seem to him to put on airs, were easier for him to mm -hmm. associate with. Uh, now why all this was, uh, this sort of persnicketiness, um, I'd be interested in hearing other people weigh in, such as Bob Gross, the canonical historian of Concord, uh, probably give a better answer than I. But um, one thing I think has to do with class. Uh, Thoreau was Harvard educated, but uh, his uh, family had been downwardly mobile. Uh, he was downwardly mobile as uh, one who refused to uh, engage in, for long, a uh, reputable profession of the kind that Harvard graduates were supposed to do. Um, and uh, that made him very self conscious about um, his status in the town. Hmm. Uh, so there's another dimension to it. He eventually won back. Uh, the, the respect that he had temporarily forfeited to a large extent by his surveying practice in which he was very successful, but that was later. So there are some answers. That's great. Uh, that pushes right forward where I want to go. And I, I, I love the image of the time that he spends with children. I think um, many of us I know are Concordians and many of us have traveled much in Concord. And um, one of the strong images I always have when I come to this space is just him walking with the Alcott children here in the town woods, just steps from where we are now in Fairyland Pond and around. And that's the other side, of course, of the lococentrism of uh, 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 the sense of place, not just the people of Concord, but of course the landscape of Concord. And so I wonder if I might invite you to say some things about um, uh, Thoreau's profound relationship with Concord's landscape. And to make that a little bit more pointed, um, when you saunter around Concord, as I know you have, are there certain places that um, you find, uh, uh, I don't want to be too spiritual and say uh, Thoreau's presence, but um, uh, are there places that people might go today where they might particularly experience some of the power of um, Thoreau's connection with this still very prominent physical landscape? Another terrific question, yes. Um, well, to the first half of it, Ryan, uh, what I think of right off is the work that uh, Ray Angelo has done mm. on uh, the micro places of Concord uh, that Thoreau mentions. Yeah. And many of them he baptizes or rebaptizes with his own pet names. So um, he's got uh, names for little uh, niches of plant colonies, bends in rivers, mud holes, you name it. Um, so he's really made himself a kind of atom of Concord through his sauntering. 
uh, I can't think of any example in um, my reading or study of people in history that matches that. Um, that is local centrism to the tenth power. Um, uh, when he talks about allegiance to the conquered soil, uh, you know he really means it. Uh, as for myself, uh, my lowly self creeping around 200 years after uh, Henry did, um, yes, there's some places <clears throat> where um, I feel that resonance. When I'm at the site of uh, his Walden house, uh, at the top of Emerson Cliffs, uh, across the way. Um, and I'll speak to the latter and then the former. I'm going to just limit to those two examples. Thoreau um, has just dozens and dozens of rapturous later journal passages about witnessing sunsets mm -hmm. from hillsides. Um, he was an epicure of the uh, changing light and color uh, that sometimes uh, he used his uh, quantitative side to describe the effects of uh, not just uh, uh, picture painting aesthetics. Uh, so uh, when I um, see um, towards the west in the afternoon in Concord from some high promontory often think of Thoreau. Uh, he's been there before me dozens of times. And then uh, looking uh, at the pond from the perspective of where his house was, um, it seemed to him, he says in Walden, as if uh, I could see across to the plains of Tartary. Here's another way of making uh, um, magnitude of the small. And especially if you consider how deforested Concord mm. was in those days, mm. it was a it's historic low point in terms mm. of woodsy cover. Um, he could see a long way, even from that little rise in uh, the eminence. Uh, and I've often played with the idea that um, Thoreau may have had some sort of wiring uh, like what uh, Ed Wilson and other environmental biologists uh, environmental biologists describe as uh, the primal habitat of humankind, um, tree-studded prominences overlooking water. Uh, that's the way it seems uh, when you're standing at the site of where the cabin was and uh, looking to the southwest. So yeah, there's some like, examples for you. Um, Bill's personal faves. <laughs> Great. I, I'm going to go off script now because I, I like that answer so much. Um, and especially the, one of the things that you bring out in the book so beautifully, and you've just mentioned here, is his, um, his intimacy with his relationship with nature and especially with color. And I was thinking about this especially. This is the best time to have this conversation because of autumnal tints and the way he describes the red maples, which happen to be, he's describing the first week of October. It's happening right now. We can see it on Cambridge Turnpike. Um, and I've always appreciated that. And it helps me get through raking the leaves of my front yard when I start cursing at them every, every fall. But um, one thing that you bring out really beautifully is that this was not just an aesthetic experience for him. Seeing these was a deeply sensual experience for him and a deeply intimate experience for him. So I don't want you to psychobiographize and we don't need to talk about his love life or lack thereof. But I would like to hear a little bit more from you about what drove this intense intimacy with the land, and also how that may have changed over time as he became less of just a nature lover and more of a, as you show so nicely, a natural scientist. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think the um, intense, almost erotic um, sense of bonding to certain landscape effects um, was was always incipiently there but it strengthened over time 
Did it strengthen because um, of the turn to science? Um, partly, but partly I think uh, there are two magnetic poles uh, in opposition as well as, mm -hmm. as uh, in uh, alignment to create a whole sphere. Um, October is a really good month to see Thoreau's affect in action, the nature affect. Um, I wish that in my book I had uh, felt I could spend more time with autumnal tints. It rarely gets a mention. But one thing it showcases is how caught on fire Thoreau was um, by the color red mm -hmm. at any season, yeah. really. But the scarlet effects of the New England autumn uh, really turned him on. I mean, turned him on <laughs> is the operative phrase here. Uh, I fell in love with the shrub oak. Um, how could that have happened? Well, um, at that point of year, that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. Um, when he gave that talk, which was something that he crystallized towards the end of his life, he got a standing ovation uh, in the Concord Lyceum. I think it may have been his singular, single most popular performance. Um, not his single largest. That was uh, one of the John Brown, John Brown speeches yeah. that he gave in Boston, but uh, his single most popular. Um, and why was it? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a feeling that we can all share, that um, everyone has to some degree, uh, even if you're not too sensitive to landscape effects, the mm -hmm. fall color show is really striking. And it had something to do with uh, nationalism as well. Um, you don't see that kind of... Um, fall coleridge in the old world in northern Europe and so not just Thoreau but other writers too of that time uh, were trying to discover the American landscape's unique features and say well maybe we don't have very much culture in this country but at least we have nature uh -huh. uh, they point to that yeah, oh, that's great. I, I love when he quotes um, Thompson, the English poet's uh, poem on the seasons, and he describes what fall looks like in England. It's brown, brown and dull yellow. Yeah, and it's a very, yes, yeah, so there's a bit of the, the national here, as you say. Um, since we're talking about place, we're talking about his time in nature, and you mentioned Walden, we have to spend a little time talking about the text, because um, in your, in, your, in your own book, it comes in the chapter of um, essential Thoreau is where, uh, and that of course seems very right. But I wonder if you could say a few more words about the book Walden and how it came to be the essential Thoreau. Why it was essential for him and also in terms of its literary reception. It's such an odd genre-defying book. Could you say a few words about why this has become the Thoreau, this as well as civil disobedience, which we'll talk about, but the Thoreau that most people know? Well, A, it's the most uh, tightly crafted long work that he wrote. Um, but that's not taking it very far. Uh, I think uh, a deeper way to understand it is that uh, it's um, a very adroit deployment of the memoir form, mm -hmm. which, by the way, has, uh, is a genre of our time. It's taken the world by storm um, since the 1990s. We're in an age, we live in an age of memoir, and you can think about why that is. Um, but uh, Thoreau um, pulled off this combination of uh, the uh, personal narrative in Walden uh, and the infusion of uh, the unique self on which he's always theoretically insisting hmm. uh, with a sense of the paradigmatic. Uh, Thoreau is um, 
not just um, a single isolated, um, unique Henry David in his way of recounting it, uh, but he's uh, going to be an example of thrift, of downscaling, um, of homesteading, of um, self-sufficiency, of bonding to nature, uh, a latter-day um, hermit sage. Um, there are all these um, paradigms that uh, Thoreau has uh, pulled in, juggled around, synthesized, availed himself of, that have provided handles for readers subsequently to grab hold of and um, make this book feel to them uh, like some kind of personal um, testimony that speaks mm. to them. Um, I'm sure that uh, there may be some of you in this room, but uh, all of you probably know somebody somewhere um, who has a sort of my Henry feeling uh, of specialness that's more likely based on this uh, than it is on civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. uh, although civil disobedience looms extremely large um, for, I think, uh, comparable reasons. Yeah, um, I've read a ton of uh, kind of neo thorough memoirs, um, one of which begins, um, it's a husband-wife memoir, we went to the woods because a hundred years ago a man wrote a book. <laughs> Guess what book that was. Um, the experiment is replicable too. Um, you can do it... Um, very close to your village. Look at Thoreau, he did. Um, a mile from any neighbor, oh wow, that's not hard to, hard to do, even, even in today's much more populated world. Um, you don't have to have um, a, a whole lot of um, cash investment. Um, you can do it in a city as well as in a country. Um, what a space it's... Uh, kind of relative. Uh, if you're feeling alienated, a little space goes a long way. Uh, or if you're feeling that you've been made to be alienated, that you are a resident alien, then a little space goes a long <laughs> way. Uh, so it's an experiment that can be um, grabbed hold of and replicated in different ways. You could do it in the way far distant deep woods, uh, or you can do it in your, your backyard almost. Oh, that's great. The, um, I love the quotation of the husband-wife couple who say that they went because a man wrote a book 100 years ago, precisely because it proves Thoreau's point. How many people have changed, can date a new era in their lives from the reading of a book? Yeah. The, uh, he says that in his re the reading chapter of Walden. He can't help but think he's hoping that his book will have that impact. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, don't we all as authors uh, hope that... Um, but. Uh, uh, my work, yes. Um, let's go one step further with Walden, because you said something that I find really intriguing, because we've been talking about the um, way in which Thoreau has this intimate association with place. But then in your book, as you rightly note, um, you, you know, the cabin's only 1.2 miles from here. Uh, it's a sh relatively short walk just across Route 2. It was hardly into the wilderness. So what was it about? Can I ask you just to sort of think out loud, even go beyond some of the things you wrote in the book? Um, what explains the profound joy that he found there, especially in the first six months, as you describe in the book? Was it that he found something there that he couldn't find somewhere else? Or was it the fact that there wasn't something there, i.e. society or the town? Was he going there to find something or to escape from something? And please don't um, weasel out by saying, well, of course it was both. <laughs> Of course, it was both. <laughs> <laughs> well, he certainly felt a sense of liberation about um, moving into the house that he had largely himself built. Mm. Um, 
by chance, he says, ha ha, on Independence Day, 1845. We know that from his Walden journals, that he's, he's over the moon, really. Mm. Um, yesterday I came here to live, uh, and he goes on rather rapturously about uh, the, the experience of, of happy solitude in, in midsummer. Um, well, I, hit, I hinted before, uh, solitude is a, a relative thing. Um, it isn't necessarily to be measured um, by uh, how physically close or distant you are from anything. Uh, he wasn't, um, not only was he not distant in terms of mileage, but um, he could be seen, this is again the deforested landscape, mm, mm, mm. by passers-by on the road to Wayland mm. um, or uh, to Cambridge. And uh, yet uh, he was um, out of the family house for a while. He kept going back to it, but on his own terms. And uh, this was the detachment that he felt he needed at that point in his life uh, for uh, taking stock of um, what at that point was a sort of crossroads for him. Um, he was having trouble with his first book. Uh, he hadn't achieved hmm. literary success. And he hadn't uh, settled on a a vocational path um, permanently, except knowing that he wanted to write if he could, um, but that didn't seem to be uh, providing support at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you could look at this in banal terms as a kind of writer's retreat where uh, he was mm -hmm. taking stock. And in fact, he did a lot of writing of Walden. He's sort of uh, duplicitous about this. He doesn't mention all the writing that he got done in Walden, uh, including uh, a lot on A Week in the Concord and Merrimack River, uh, some, uh, uh, an essay, and um, the first draft of Walden begun. But uh, never mind that. I'm not going to wrist slap. Uh, I'm trying to muse about um, what it meant to him. So maybe that'll great hold you for a while. <laughs> There's an element of mystery to this. I mean, that's one of the great things about um, Walden that uh, it hints at um, what it might have meant to him to do what uh, to do the thing that he did. But um, he's cagey. Uh, uh, he's, he uh, talks in metaphorical terms about the past enterprises that he had cherished that hadn't panned out mm. uh, and then kind of retreats into a generalization. There are more secrets in my trade than most men, so I'm not going to you know, go into great detail. But what he does say more flat out uh, has to do with the spiritual things, the inner stakes and um, the second chapter of the book where I live and what I live for um, that comes to culmination in the gospel of living deliberately and what that means um, so it's inner transformation that he's after uh, rather than uh, the outward locus and material details of the um, experiment per se, mm. although those matter to him as well as a kind of proof that um, someone of modest means can really um, live self-sufficiently. Yeah. Um, you know, your book is very sensitive to the idea in which Thoreau's even aware of some of the privileges that he has being able to live in these sorts of experiences. Um, having now talked about Walden a bit, um, that's, of course, though, only one of two of the texts that you focus on in your chapter on essential Thoreau. And the other is the one that you've mentioned now, um, we both mentioned a few times, Civil Disobedience, uh, or at least the title that is later known by. Um, I wonder if I could invite you to say a few words about uh, 
Thoreau's political thought, if we can speak that way. I, I confess that I make my living as a student of political philosophy, and the Thoreau that's in my world is the Thoreau largely of civil disobedience and of the essays on John Brown. And one thing I've never been able to understand, and hopefully you can help me so that I can tell this to my students, um, which is how these two things go together. Because on the one hand, we have this incredible praise of nonviolent, conscientious objection. On the other hand, tremendous praises of this great hero who was famous most of all for very stark violence. How do these two things go together? Yeah, that's an anvil that has destroyed many hammers. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interpreters. I think part of the solution is that um, the, uh, the temperature of uh, progressive New England changed. Uh, Thoreau's uh, cohort changed between uh, the Mexican War and the eve of uh, the Civil War. <laughs> so that uh, the northern progressives uh, felt more and more desperate about being encroached upon by slavery interests, uh, and that created more receptivity to rethinking the, the means of resistance. Uh, so it wasn't just Thoreau, uh, it was others too uh, in his network that um, became uh, more receptive to the kind of guerrilla tactics that Brown was engaging in. I think it helped that Brown was uh, doing what he did uh, a thousand miles away. Mm. If it had been uh, in the Boston metro area, that might have been a different story. Mm. But Thoreau, Thoreau um, does certainly change in his um, stance from Nonviolence to countenancing violence. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a side of Thoreau, I think, that personally resonated with John Brown. Mm. Uh, he thought John Brown was a man of rockward integrity. John Brown was a, of New England stock, a son of the Puritans. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a fellow surveyor. Huh. Um, he was. Um, a kind of quintessence for Thoreau of the kind of person who would not be moved by public pressure. But he would go his own way hmm. according hmm. to his own lights. Uh, and uh, all of that um, made for um, uh, an astonishing turnaround from the first and still, I think, deservedly most famous political discourse in Thoreau and Civil Disobedience, yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, you're explaining, a, uh, you, you try to explain a dramatic shift um, that can't be explained away. I mean, I don't think that uh, the defense of Brown can be made consistent as a matter of political theory with civil disobedience when That's how I think uh, the shift occurred. And if that seems problematic, which in theory, of course, it is, um, well, people shift, and Thoreau reserves the right for his opinion to shift. He says both in Walden and in civil disobedience, similar kinds of things. Mm. This is my position at present he says, in civil disobedience, meaning uh, I'm not to be held to this forever, necessarily. Hmm. And there's similar terms that uh, you see in Walden. Uh, and if you think that there's something um, engaging about the idea of um, a seeker mentality that's always questing after new truth or new vistas, uh, then um, one can comment on that that is precisely this, that mm. uh, what you find lovable at a certain stage can turn into something quite different. Mm. Um, so 
So I was going to say one more thing, and maybe it'll come to me, but I probably said enough on that for now, I guess. <laughs> Well, uh, to follow up, I mean, one of the challenges that I think the book really brings out is the dangers of trying to pigeonhole Thoreau into being a political thinker. Ah, that, uh, yes, that's the other thing I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Get it while you're on the trail. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm perhaps I um, was a fool that waded in where uh, I should have feared to tread. Uh, I did really um, pontificate some uh, about what might count as bona fide political theory uh, in that chapter that I wrote. Um, and I'd be keen to hear you weigh in and, and take issue if you're so moved. Uh, but I did come away um, thinking that the, the political thorough if we can call him that, the Thoreau of uh, the John Brown mm -hmm. uh, defenses of uh, slavery in Massachusetts, of um, uh, civil disobedience especially, the famous one, uh, that this was a kind of sub-canon in Thoreau's writing uh, that um, was extremely uh, intense and important in its own way. But if you look at the total Thoreau, everything he wrote, it occupies only yeah, a fraction. Right. And uh, even more, if you look at the track record of Thoreau's activism, it was sporadic. Um, but then Thoreau's oppositionalism, um, as Emerson said, his instinct was to controvert a, pro a proposition when he heard it. That was chronic. Hmm. So you could say that uh, the political thorough is always there as a residual, even if it's not there, um, except sporadically, as an explosion. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, yeah, and seeing the way it percolates in different places is really remarkable and nicely brought out in the book. Um, just to go a step even further with the political throw and the degree we can talk that way. I mean, one thing that you nicely bring out is the degree to which politics is really never the end that throws after. The end is always inner. It's self-cultivation, self-perfection. And so one of the things that I'm moved to wonder is, um, is he in the wrong department these days in academics? Shouldn't he be seen properly as a moral philosopher? You used the phrase his virtue ethics at one point. Um, would it make sense to think of him in terms of um, moral philosophy even more so than political philosophy? Well, I think one of the problems of the academic division of labor. <laughs> yes, I'm aware of it, yeah. <laughs> is that it carves the realms of knowledge up uh, in a way that um, disaggregates a figure like Thoreau. Um, you could add departments, by the way, um, to um, philosophy and government and literature, um, try some of the sciences and mm. engineering. Um, so the division of labor within the knowledge industry uh, creates some parallaxes in trying to uh, understand um, the whole human being that was the complex story. Um, I'm sort of reminded about how um, In a scholar, young scholar's progress uh, at the graduate studies level and then at the next uh, level of trying to get tenure, uh, you have to satisfy the idols of the tribe, <laughs> <laughs> even though uh, your own mind is much more far reaching and gloriously complex than uh, the knowledge base that you have to show a mastery of. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> in a sense, Thoreau could be said to belong to the realms of moral philosophy uh, rather than to politics or literature. 
But I hate that rather than. Yeah, um, good. And uh, when I characterize him as a village Leonardo in one of my chapters, I really like that. Um, <laughs> was he really Leonardo? No, he wasn't. But he rattled off all those uh, accomplishments that I say, areas of accomplishment that I say he had. And, um, so um, for that, I admire him. Uh, and for <coughs> any attempts made, and I've made some of those attempts, to kind of corral him for a particular discipline, well, I slap my hand. Yeah. Good. Uh, I can't resist asking, now you mentioned the village of Leonardo. Uh, not far from here is um, Thoreau's flute, which uh, is also represented here, now a precious object here in the Concord Museum's collection. And um, could you say just the briefest word about his flute playing and his dancing, which I knew so little about until you mentioned it here, and also his ice skating, which I'm fascinated by as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, all right, there's a story behind the flute. Uh, my editor, Nancy Cott, who is also Reed Gottsberg's editor, uh, is herself a flautist and a very accomplished historian mm -hmm. of the flute. And early on, when uh, I was cooking the book, she said, there's one thing that I've requested of you and one thing only. You have to mention Thoreau's flute. <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, that... Um, converged with uh, an interest in mind, which was to try to represent uh, in text and also visually um, something um, about Thoreau's um, uh, multi-performance um, interests and prowess uh, other than just the uh, literary side. Um, and so that way, the flute found itself yeah, into the book uh, as an image and also something of a mention. Good. Um, so that's the flute. Um, dancing, I'm a terrible dancer, and I'm not going to say anything about flute dancing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Except that uh, he was considered to be quite something. Uh, the ice skating, um, there's a lovely um, anecdote in Sophia Hawthorne's journal. Mrs. Nathaniel Hawthorne, watching uh, her husband, Emerson, and Thoreau skate. Hmm. And uh, Emerson <laughs> was leaning over kind of in a febrile way, as if he might sort of fall down. Um, <laughs> they didn't look like a jock at all. <laughs> um, and Henry was doing these wild, dithyrambic leaps on the ice. <laughs> Very ugly, he thought, said Mrs. Hawthorne. Whereas Mr. Hawthorne brought up the rear, grave as a statue, and obviously um, he was the admirable one in the eyes of um, uh, his adoring spouse. Uh -huh. um, this was sort of honeymoon times for the Hawthorne, so uh, their relationship was at its best at that point. Um, so there's ice skating, yeah. um, wild, dithyrambic leaps. <laughs> what a great image. I will never be able to see Concord pond hockey again without thinking about this. So, um, I'm conscious of the time that we're getting close to the hour, Ooh, but well, we, we might have a little bit of time. Can we save some time for audience questions? Oh, wait a minute. I want yeah. to just show the other image that is in the book, courtesy of Concord Museum. Mm. That's Thoreau's sister, Sophia. Uh, who was um, uh, his companion on uh, some botanical excursions, uh, also a lover of music, um, someone with whom he was very close, nursed him through his last illness, uh, was his first literary executor. It's a wonderful image. Uh, all the other um, thorough biographies and books that image Sophia he was a lousy image. Uh, the big fat bun next to him. And uh, I just was overjoyed to discover this and grateful that the museum let me use it. So, boom, 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 boom. Yes. Great. Do we have a moment yeah, for some questions? Yeah.
Oh. I won't pick until I see a hand. Yeah. We have one in the back here. Do you need me to stand? Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you say something about Thoreau's relationship to adult women, including Mary Moody Emerson? Thoreau's relationship with adult women, that was not his strong point. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, especially drawn to somewhat older women who seemed to him thinking persons. Uh, and chief among them, uh, Lydia and Emerson, Emerson's second wife. Um, it's been asserted off and on over the years that he was in love with Emerson's wife. I don't think that that was true. Um, I think um, I'm willing to take him at his own say so, his bottom line was that she was like a very dear sister to me. Um, and uh, there was no question that there was um, a kind of spiritual platonic resonance there. Um, he did, um, along with his brother, briefly court uh, a young woman, Ellen Sewell, during a, a summer romance. They both proposed to her. She turned them both down. Um, but the scholars who would prefer not to think of Thoreau um, as having um, homoerotic tendencies, which I think probably he did, um, like to showcase that as, as an example. But there is... Um, Outside of his family, uh, no um, case other than with Lydia and Emerson of anything like a long-term uh, relationship with another adult woman. Uh, but I think it's important to say outside of his family, because clearly uh, with his two sisters, uh, Helen and Sophia, he did have a very close relationship, although it's not documented by um, letters except when they were apart, which wasn't very often. Um, so uh, I think what we're faced with uh, is uh, a person who pretty quickly in his life became a singleton confirmed bachelor, and uh, you can uh, take that evidential and um, then the erotic develop the dimension of his uh, attraction to nature and you know, really make hay out of it from a psychological <laughs> perspective. Um, but, um, we can't end on that note, though. Not, yeah. no, 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 no. Do, do we have time for one more quick one? Yeah, a, a quick question. I, I, I think I saw it over here, John. Hi, thank you. Um, today at the pond, a visitor asked me if Walden was Thoreau's autobiography. And I never really know how to answer that. And so I wanted to ask you, how much do you think is the real Thoreau in the book and how much is the idealized Thoreau? Because he seems to blend both of them back and forth. I think it's an autobiography only up to a point. That, and I tried to speak to that earlier on. Um, yes, it has a memoir dimension to it, and that's extremely important. But it isn't called Walden for nothing. Hmm. Um, you could argue just as forcefully that the hero is the pond. Um, as to the real Thoreau uh, versus an idealized Thoreau, um, I think that uh, there are elements of both, of both at different times. Uh, sometimes um, uh, he seems to be uh, fairly uh, unbuttoned and transparent, and other times he seems to be one to um, mysticize his experience. 
Um, partly, um, the book takes on that mixed air aura that it does, I think, because uh, it took such a long time to write, and it didn't get completed until um, seven years after he left the pond. Uh, so there's a kind of nostalgic dimension to it um, uh, that um, is not the whole story of Walden, but it's um, part of uh, the book's effect. A contra, the very first draft, which is sketched out uh, within a uh, year or so after he leaves the pond, much shorter. Uh, and uh, where the economy chapter is even a larger fraction of the total result. Uh, so, um, oh, another thing I'll say uh, is that you could look at Walden as a project that uh, kind of continues uh, throughout almost Quarrel's whole adult, adult lifetime. Hmm. Um, from the time he starts writing his journal uh, in his, uh, his early 20s uh, to the late years, uh, Walden is repeatedly referenced. It's the first reference is a place that seems like a very good uh, spot to go and um, meditate or perch or live. Uh, and afterward, he returns to Walden, oh, scores of times, uh, both in body and in dream. Uh, so, uh, go figure. Um, uh, <laughs> in that sense, Walden becomes a kind of uh, spiritual center for, for his whole life, and not just uh, uh, within the bounds of the book itself. Thank you for asking that question. Right. And I'm going to say at this point, thank you, Larry. This has been a real joy. The book is wonderful. I see there are copies for sale, I presume, over here in the corner. I couldn't recommend it more. Um, and uh, it, it's been such a pleasure to, to hear from you and learn from you. So thank you for joining us tonight in Concord. Thank you. Thank you. for coming. Um, that was great. Thank you, Ryan. Boy, this, oops, let's turn this off. <laughs>